Well, I am here in Izmir, Turkey. You can hear the call to prayer going on and the sound behind me. Today, it's a mostly Muslim city of over four million people. But for Christians, it's probably most famous as one of the seven cities that Jesus Christ wrote a letter to in the book of Revelation, chapters two and three, through the pen of the apostle John. Now, Smyrna is an amazing place. Just in the last 10 years or so, they've begun doing archeological excavations here in earnest. And I am standing in the ruins of the ancient Agora. This was a marketplace. In those days, it was basically a three-story high shopping mall. Smyrna was known for its beauty and almost tropical climate. It was the closest major city to Greece, to Europe, from Asia Minor, and it's a beautiful sail right across the Aegean Sea, straight to Athens. Smyrna took pride in its history. Now, it had been wiped out in 600, and again, 545 BC by the Persians, and abandoned for about 200 years, just in ruins. But Alexander the Great said he was told in a dream to refound it, and this city, came back from the dead. By the first century before Christ, it was described as the most beautiful of all cities on planet Earth. That its literature was filled with references to the city coming back from the dead. It once was dead, but is now alive. Smyrna was also the headquarters for the myrrh trade. Its major client was Egypt, because the Egyptians used a lot of myrrh to embalm mummies. And so in a way, the death industry was huge here in Smyrna. So no wonder that Jesus kind of camps out on this theme, the theme of death and life. The Christians here were undergoing persecution and suffering during the reign of the emperor Domitian. He is systematically persecuting and murdering Christians. Smyrna is also the center of the emperor cult, the worship of Caesar as God. So it was an especially hard place to be a Christian in the first century. And maybe this was all typified in one particular citizen of this city. His name was Polycarp. Polycarp was trained by John, the very same John who was the youngest and most beloved disciple of Jesus, the same John who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the Gospel of John, and the book of Revelation. John trained Polycarp in Ephesus and then sent Polycarp to this city of ancient Smyrna, modern day Izmir. And he was apparently the bishop overseeing all the pastors, all the leaders in this particular area. Polycarp was arrested and sentenced to death because he was unwilling to worship the Roman emperor. And so when they brought Polycarp to his place of execution, they asked him if he wanted to renounce his faith and deny Jesus, thereby sparing his own life. And here's what he had to say. For 80 and six years, I have served Christ and he has done me no wrong. How can I now blaspheme my king who saved me? The Roman judge pleaded with him and basically said, listen, you're an old man, I don't wanna kill you. I, I won't even make you say Caesar is Lord, just say, away with the atheists. That's because the pagans called Christians atheists because they didn't worship a visible God who had an idol or a temple or some kind of statue. And next, Polycarp lifts his finger and points to the Roman crowd calling for his blood and says, all right, away with the atheists. And then the crowd really went crazy and they ended up burning him at the stake, or at least they tried. It actually took so long, according to some accounts, that finally a guard ran up and stabbed him, and Polycarp finally died. And you know what the Christians here did after that horrible event? They flourished. This city is the only one of the seven churches that has had an uninterrupted Christian presence for 2,000 years which is very intriguing because when Revelation was written, this was the place where the future of the church was the grimmest. Maybe being a Christian in your town may make you discouraged, but Jesus doesn't want you to be discouraged. He wants you to be encouraged and hopeful and faithful. And in the letter that he gave to the church in this city 2,000 years ago, there are amazing principles that apply to you. So with that background, let's look at what Jesus says in Revelation 2. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, or modern Izmir, write, the words of the first and the last 
who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. I also know this, the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now that sounds very pejorative against the Jews, doesn't it? But what it's talking about is, is not the fact that they were Jews, but the fact that they were slandering their brothers. You see, in those days, Christians were considered really kind of a subset of the Jews. And the Jews were exempted from emperor worship. So that meant as long as Christians were identified as part of the synagogue, they wouldn't be persecuted by the emperor. Well, there was a rift that developed, and apparently here in Smyrna, some of the Jews were slandering the Christians to the Romans, saying, hey, they're not part of us. And apparently the slander consisted of saying the Christians were cannibals because they claimed to eat the flesh and drink the blood of their savior. And so they were slanderously saying, these, these Christians are cannibals. And that's what this is talking about. But Jesus says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So Jesus is saying there are four ways that you will be or may be mistreated as I was. Number one, he says, there will be tribulation. Being a Christian will make your life more difficult in some ways. But the hopeful thing Jesus says is, for 10 days you will have tribulation. Now that doesn't mean a literal 10 days. The point is that the time you suffer is limited. God will set a limit to it. And then second, he says, there will be poverty. Being a Christian will cost you money, you might lose jobs or raises. And then number three, you'll be slandered. Being a Christian means that your reputation might be destroyed. People might say things that are untrue about you or your church or what you believe. And number four, it could even include death. Now, of course, we don't aspire to die. There's not a cult of martyrdom in the Christian faith, but he's saying it has happened and it will sometimes happen. And of course, it happens tragically to this day. Some of you, because your faith, have lost family or friends or have experienced rejection or the loss of income. And Jesus says, I know. And Jesus wants you to open your ears to a word that he has for you. And you know what it is? It's the first phrase that he says here to the Christians at Smyrna. It's really the only thing he tells them to do. He says, do not fear. Did you know that do not fear is the command that is repeated more than any other command in the Bible? Because the Fear is such a basic problem in human nature. And fear is a huge problem when it comes to being faithful to God. Why? Because fear makes us into false prophets. Fear causes us to imagine a future only full of negative possibilities. And that's why fear paralyzes you. Fear cuts you off from the future that God wants you to have because basically you bench yourself and your possibilities out of fear. So Jesus is saying to you and to me, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of right now? That fear could be what is paralyzing you. Instead of being worried about things, what you ought to do is just be concerned about doing what God wants and then let God worry about the future, so to speak. Put the future into God's hands. Now, I want to be clear about something. Fear is not always a sin. Fear is not always a demonstration of a lack of faith but fear is always an opportunity to trust God and get to know him better. So you see here in this letter to Smyrna, Jesus does not promise that life will always be easy. In fact, the exact opposite. He promises that there will be difficult times ahead for sure, but he promises to be with you. He tells you not to fear, and then he talks about a reward. He says, the crown of life awaits. Now that's probably a reference to the ancient games like they had at places here like Smyrna. And in the ancient games, the winner would get a crown that was made out of laurel leaves. And he's saying, a crown awaits you. Now you might be thinking, big deal, I get a plant on my head. But see, the laurel wreath actually represented much more. The winner of the games not only got a laurel wreath, but get this, he got freedom from taxation from the rest of his or her life, 
all debts were written off. He got an invitation to dine at the king's table or the governor's table, and his or her name memorialized in stone. And I was thinking about this, that's kind of what's wrapped up in this promise for you and for me too. An invitation to the king's table, all debts written off, our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You know, it's not that our suffering earns our salvation, but it does earn rewards. Jesus is saying the crown of life that awaits you is worth far more than any suffering you undergo right now. Kind of like Mother Teresa famously said, she said, in the light of eternity, even a life full of suffering will seem like one night in a bad hotel. You know, you may wonder if anybody sees your pain, if anybody sees your sacrifices, your affliction, and Jesus says in these words to the church at Smyrna and to you that he sees you, he sees, he knows, and one day he will give thanks and give you the crown of life, an everlasting reward. So think about those words. Thank you.